everybody. Welcome to episode number five of my Friends with Benefits series. It's the last episode of this month. Um, thank you if you've been watching along so far. I really appreciate it. Um, and more than that, I just hope you've gotten something out of it. I hope that you've learned as much as I've been learning about yourself, about health, wellness, everything that we've talked about. Um, I don't know where I'm going with this The in the next coming month. I may keep this series going. I do have more people in mind that I want to interview. Um, I may end it, I might take a break from it, I might make a whole different series. So I would really, really appreciate your feedback. Um, just let me know what you want to hear more of, what you found interesting, what your favorite one was. You can leave it in the comments, um, just so I know where to go from here. But anyway, aside from that, today is going to be so fun. I'm very excited. I'm interviewing Nick. He's a psychologist, but I'll let him introduce himself in a little bit once he comes on. Um, this is my absolute favorite topic to talk about. Um, I don't know. I don't know why. I think it's just interesting. I think understanding ourselves is interesting. Like, I mean, I guess it sounds kind of self-absorbed, but I just think psychology is beautiful and it's so deep. There's so much to know. Like, you can you can make so many conversation conversations about it. But today we're just gonna focus on a few set of specific things. Nance, where's Nikki's gorgeous face? That's what I'm saying. He hasn't gotten on yet, so I'm waiting for him. Right, let's see, maybe let me just request him now. Invite. Maybe he has to be on. Um, anyway, it's gonna be a good one, guys. I'm gonna explain to you in just a sec how I know him. Oops, okay. So anyway, um, for the people who don't know him, just a little background before he gets on. I met Nick at Russo's when I was working there. This is like what, I mean, I guess not 10 years ago, a little less than that. Maybe like, I don't know, less than 10 years ago. I met him over there. Um, we were young, I mean, we're still young, but like he wasn't in school yet for psychology. Um, and we just had a really great friendship. He, we communicated a lot. We gave each other advice. Um, and naturally, I understand now why he's a therapist. I feel like he's meant for it. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions that you want to start asking when he comes in, oh, there he is. Um, we're going to be talking about mainly, oh, Nance. Yeah, he was in high school when we met. <laughs> so that shows how much time has passed. Um, let's see if he's coming on. Unable to join. Why? Hold on. Let me try again. Sorry, y'all. Oh, there you are. Hello. Wow, I got a little nervous. That's never happened to me. It said you were unable to join. I got your request and then I couldn't click it in time. It went away too fast. Oh, hey, Nikki. <laughs> I was kind of telling everyone how we met, that it was at good old Russo's. Um, but you can introduce yourself because I don't want them to only know that we worked at Russo's. <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah, we met. I was in high school. I was 16. I know. That's what Nanny was saying. She's because I was like, I don't remember when it was. And she was like, he was in high school. And she wrote it there. Right. Um, yeah, 16. A little baby. Um, so where are you at now? What are you doing now? Now I am in grad school. I'm getting my um, doctorate in clinical psych. Um, so I graduated undergrad like three years ago and then jumped right into this program. Um, and then, yeah, I'm going into my fourth year and then it's internship and then it's postdoc and then getting licensed and the whole ordeal. Time flies, you're, you're in it. Yeah. Um, okay, so why don't we start with you telling everyone why you chose psychology? Was there a specific reason? Did it just call you? What was your, your reasoning? Um, I felt like it was maybe a calling. Like I remember when I was in eighth grade, I wanted to do psychology for reasons that are so much different now than they were back then. I just thought it, I was like, what's the most cool little spiritual <laughs> do uh, as a career? And I always thought psychology was dope. I was like, oh, you can like basically read people's minds whenever 
sitting down with somebody and you're reading their mind when they're talking to you. Um, and yeah, and then that kind of just turned into, um, I don't know, like a journey and a process. Psychology is like very scientific. Um, a lot of research, uh, a lot of studying that goes into it. Um, but as I've grown in the field more and as I've seen clients and gotten supervision and, and worked a lot with different people, psychology is just as much of a science as it is uh, like a, a spiritual thing at the same time, this exchange of energy that happens between you and somebody else. Um, so yeah. So good. I love it. Um, what's the majority of your clientele of the patients that you see now? Um, the majority, well, right now I'm at a, a university counseling center. Okay. So I'm 18 to 30, depending. Um, I have a client that's 29, another one that's like 20. I've had clients that were like 19. And then last year I was working primarily with uh, children, adolescents. So I had a client that was six years old and my oldest client was 18. Oh, I didn't know that. Six years old. God. <laughs> That's heavy. Anything in specific, though, like people dealing with depression or family issues, or was it just like general stuff? Pretty general. Everybody comes in for something different. I had, um, I've had clients come in because they were, um, like there was a lot of problematic behavior in school and it was kind of like mandated by the school. I've had clients come in because of family issues or relationship issues or struggling with sexuality and, and faith. Um, so it's a broad spectrum, which is why I like working at the university counseling center because you get somebody that's coming with a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. So that's awesome. Um, so I didn't know until honestly, until like yesterday or today when we were briefing each other that you specialize in, um, I don't know if you say you specialize, but you are kind of centered in men's mental health. Um, so do you want to talk a little more about that? Yeah, I, one of my like areas of emphasis is definitely men's mental health. Um, it's what I'm doing my dissertation on. Um, specifically, uh, sexism, depression, and Christian men. Um, so it's just looking at what the literature says about um, perpetuating sexist acts or being a sexist person and how that can affect your mental health. Um, so people that hold ideologies that are very gendered and very um, biased, especially towards women. Um, and yeah, how that like internally does something to the man that is actually perpetuating these acts. So it's like, I think it's pretty well known now that like when you're the receiver of um, some kind of um, sexualized comment or like some kind of sexism in general whether it be like hostile which is like very much overt and like disrespectful to something that's benevolent right so benevolent in nature meaning it's um it's kind of like a kind act of sexism it's like oh this box is really heavy for you young lady let me pick it up and do it for you and it just creates a narrative in somebody's mind that like i'm too weak i can't do this myself and i need a man to help mm. me. um which just isn't true um so that's good. Um, so let's talk about like depression, right? Because your emphasis is on men's mental health. Does that look different in men and women? Are there differences in how that manifests? Yeah, actually there are. So you have the basic like baseline criteria for depression, which is um, kind of like your sleep patterns are disrupted. Eating is off, just like a general loss of hope. Um, not have not having the same interest in things that you once had before. Um, I think a lot of people can almost self diagnose with depression. And it kind of comes in waves and, and here and there. But in men, it looks a little bit different. Um, because well, from what the literature says, um, in regards to how it's expressed, right, because men don't ex like have the opportunity to express emotions in the same way because of the way society has like, kind of shaped men to be. Um, oh, I see one of my professors from undergrad is on here. I hope I make you proud. She was <laughs> a gender studies professor. Um, yeah, so it, it, it kind of expresses itself differently. There's like research that shows that men um, commit suicide differently than women do for the most part. Um, men use more kind of like, uh, what's the word? Um, just got so nervous, man. Um, it's okay, take your time men use more like hostile ways to kill themselves for the most part, like other, okay. 
graphic or whatever, but like shooting themselves or uh, jumping off a building or hanging themselves, um, where as women will do something a little more like I passive for the most part, like taking a lot of pills or um, some kind of self mutilation. So depression and um, and suicide look differently in men and women, but that's it's also like culturally regarded, right? So we need to look at like what culture says about like men's ability to express emotion and what's acceptable for men to express and what not what's not. Do you see Nanny's question there? Do you want to answer that? What's the biggest difference in approach to mental health that you see in California versus South Florida? Oh God. Um, <laughs> a, um, I've been in Southern California for like the better half of a decade now. So my training and all this stuff has taken place here. But from what I can tell, and I don't want to assume what the mental health field is like in South Florida because I'm really not sure. But um, culturally, I know that uh, South Florida is like very saturated with Hispanic, Latino people, Caribbean people um, that don't, for the most part, take into consideration like the importance of therapy. And that's like part of our culture, right? That like everything is kept in the home. We mm -hmm. talk to our families, even if our families are a little more apt to not want to talk about mental health related issues. Um, so seeking services, right, from either a psychiatrist or a psychologist is considered problematic or you have to be really like fucked up, you know, for the most part. Um, like you tell someone that you're going to see a therapist and their first thought is probably like, what is wrong with you? You know, like, mm -hmm. um, crazy people go to therapists. That's, that's common. I mean, I've been going to therapy and I've gotten just a few, a handful of those, you know, comments of like, is everything okay? You know? And it's, it's funny cause it probably, you're probably right. It just happens more here than I guess it does where you're at. Right. Um, I think in, in California, there's, um, I don't know how the school systems work in Florida either, um, but I think California puts a little bit more of an emphasis on mental health for the most part. It's talked about more, um, the conversations are circulating. I, I worked in two different school districts in a number of different schools, and all of them had um, services for their students um, that were at no cost, like the school paid for them and any student. Uh -huh work with a therapist for the year or for 12 sessions or for however long it lasted until termination. Um, Nancy has another question. She says, you mentioned the word multiple times. Um, I'm assuming she means like the word of God. I don't know. Right. How has that impacted your journey in psychology? You mentioned the word multiple times. Are you talking about the, the Bible? Let's wait till she clarifies. Um, I just want to circle back in case you want to talk about, I don't know if you were done talking about like the societal expectations that um, impact men in their mental health. Was there anything else on that? Oh, oh she's she said um, <laughs> Yeah, I'll like, let me jump into like this question really quick and then I'll okay. answer that. Um, the word. Yeah, it has like a lot. In like more ways than one, I think in the beginning it was like kind of a, a I don't know, I think my faith right now is just something that's up in the air, um, which in part is due to like my journey in like psychology and what I've learned and then also personal stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I think my my faith has shaped the way I, I see psychology for the most part and how I work with my clients. I think because of my awareness to like religion and what we call like religious defenses, um, I've, I don't know, I, I really don't know. That's a really good question. Um, spirituality in general, I think is a big part of psychology, whether some people like to admit it or not. Um, I think it's like a, it was a question that we were asked a lot in, in school and it was like, do you think that psychology can exist without some kind of spiritual component or aspect? And I think some psychologists and some trainees and, and people in my position can argue for both sides. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would say no, I would say that I don't think we can exist. Um, I don't think psychology can exist as a field without a spiritual component, whether it's what the client is bringing in, right? If the client is bringing in some aspect of their spirituality, or if you're acknowledging what's happening in the room between you and somebody else, right? So as I sit with you in this space, right, there's like energy that's being transferred. There's things that you're not saying that still for some reason I'm feeling, right? And mm -hmm. we 
definitions in psychology is transference and countertransference and whatever. But for the most part, it is it is this kind of like spiritual exchange of of my goals. I think. I'm writing that down because I want to stay on topic, but I kind of want to talk about that later because you've talked to me about transference, and I think that's like mind blowing. So I'll get back to that later. But um, so yeah, so men's mental health. Um, the societal expectations. Did we cover everything there yet? I actually have. Um, it's a study that was done, and I wish I can I can put it in the chat, but I'd have to go and find it. It's in my laptop somewhere that I read when I I think um, my dissertation, and um, it just it just speaks to how strongly society genders um, people and things and objects and colors and and whatnot, and um, some and the study basically put. A whole bunch of I, I believe it was college students in a room and on the other side of this mirror or it was either on, a, on the other side of a mirror or on a TV that they're watching the researchers told the college students that baby's a boy that baby's a girl that baby's a boy that baby's a girl whatever mm -hmm. um, and gender randomly assigned right it, the baby wasn't actually a boy or it could have been a boy or the baby wasn't actually a girl or it could have been a girl yeah. and they asked the college students or whoever it was that was in that control group to say, um, I want you to start naming off some qualities that you see in each of these babies, unbeknownst to the people that like that the, the researchers stating, oh, that's a boy, that's a girl, that's a boy, that's a girl was part of the experiment. And immediately the, the students that were like observing the babies were like giving very masculine qualities to the babies that were told that's a boy and very feminine qualities to the babies that were told that's a girl. Um, without having any information about these babies or their, or their um, biological sex or anything like that. So I just thought that was really interesting because I think we do that in society all the time. We gender things. Um, and when we do that, we start to put things in a box and that box gets smaller and smaller and smaller as we grow older because more and more is expected of us um, to fit into the confines of the genders that we were um, assigned, you know, at birth. Yeah. Um, so um, as you can imagine, if somebody is not really fitting the mold of that box that they've been put into, um, their things come up, you know, for them. Um, and then when you don't have an outlet to express the things that are coming up for you, because it's culturally regarded for men not to cry, for men not to basically bitch, for men not to say things that are, um, I don't know, too emotional, right? Emotions and talking about your emotions is like a feminine quality. Um, mm -hmm communication and, and whatever um i don't know you you're shoving things down in a box and anybody knows that when you shove things down in a box like pre and when enough pressure builds something comes out so that's why um men tend to be a little more aggressive than women right um and i think it's just this inability to like express emotion and a lot of times it's not even their fault you know it's not anybody's fault except this box that we've shoved everybody into um you notice the more hyper masculine a man it is, probably the more aggressive he is too. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if there's like a correlation or a study on that somewhere, but I can almost infer that right now. So, how does that play a role in like in relationships in terms of like you were talking about communication? Um, I think that plays like a big role. I think I think when you think of relationships, right, when you think of your stereotypical like male female relationship, it's the woman who's always talking about her feelings and the man that's kind of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just like the narrative that plays in our minds too. And I think that's what we kind of see as like normal for the most part. Um, but I, uh, I don't know, I would say it's like pretty problematic. I would say like communication just in general is like a big thing. We were talking on the phone earlier, not to veer too much off of this like topic of, of men and, and women in relationships but um communication can we talk about that for a second go at it yeah <laughs> um let's talk about communication i was telling uh dre to those of you guys that are still like listening um <laughs> that um that i think what we expect from a partner a lot is communication we talk about it all the time that's what everybody says i just want a partner that communicates i want a partner that can talk to me i want a partner that can tell me this is how they're feeling and this is what they're thinking and this is what they want X, Y, and Z and this, that, and the next. Um, and uh, what 
what is often lost on people is that you can talk and you can communicate to your blue in the face, right? And communication is great. I think it's one of the most important things. But what we lose in, 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 in that whole process is the ability to understand sometimes. I can talk to you and I can tell you how I'm feeling, where I'm at, whatever. And if you're not understanding where I'm coming from, if you're not taking the time to like kind of internalize and take this in without your your emotions clouding it or, or anything like that, then all that communication was for nothing, right? So. So good. So uh, good. I, just, you, I mean, you basically said the same thing. Wait, what? No, I said like, don't just communicate, but like try to understand, you know, your partner. Yeah. Yeah. And like, it's funny because we say things which are true. I'm not like saying they're not valid, but like communication is key and communication is so important. It's the most important thing. And although it is like, you're absolutely right. Like your communication can get you nowhere unless there's understanding of that communication. Right. Blows my mind. Um, okay. What else can we hit here? Um, oh, I don't know if you've talked about it yet. Um, but when we briefed each other previously, you talked about the word toxic and how it's thrown around and that direction. Yeah. Let's talk about toxicity. Let's talk about how it's thrown around, right? Like, oh my God, my toxic, my partner's this, my partner's that, or this person is toxic. Um, yeah, oh my God, they could be. They could very well be the <laughs> person you've ever experienced in your life. Or they could not be. You guys can be playing into like patterns that exist in your life and, and, um, and I, I, I think uh, toxicity is a word that's just thrown around a lot without like a lot of like, I don't know, good, good backing behind it. Um, and then it's like, what are we contributing to the relationship to, right? When we start to talk about what's toxic and what's not toxic, um, who are the kind of people that we are seeking out in relationships, right? Normally we're seeking out people if we're uh, a person that hasn't taken the time to get to know ourselves, to fall in love with ourselves, to... Um, move in a direction with ourselves first we look for people that are going to fulfill something in us that's missing right and normally that thing that's missing is the thing that we lacked in our childhood experiences um give you a personal example i feel like i actively seek out people that are a little more emotionally avoidant um and it's because emotional avoidance is something that i dealt with growing up a lot so I, in my mind i think if i can find someone Obviously, this isn't like a conscious thing that's happening all the time. I'm not right. like, oh, that guy is emotionally avoidant. Let me go yeah. find him. <laughs> um, but if I'm, uh, yeah, back, back on track. Um, <laughs> my mind went to all the boys. <laughs> um, yeah, if I can, if I, I'm unconsciously seeking out somebody that's emotionally avoidant because that's what I know, right? Emotional avoidance is what I know. It's what I'm comfortable with. Right, being comfortable with it doesn't mean that I act, I actually, I like it or I enjoy it, but it just means that it's something that I know I'm familiar with it. So mm -hmm. I, in a partner, and I find it, and then it becomes a self fulfilling prophecy. You see, you can never meet my needs. But I was looking for that because the hope is if I can find somebody that's emotionally avoidant, like my mom was, like my dad was, um, and then I can get them to love me in a way that my mom and dad couldn't, then it'll fulfill something in me. Wow. I have been looking for forever. Right. So it's that like we perpetuate patterns ourselves and then we find ourselves with a toxic partner, but we looked for them. We saw mm -hmm. them around, right? And, and then um, what you're gonna hear often is like, I only find these people. I only like, um, these are the only people that are attracted to me. And it's always like a dirt guy or like a, like a horrible girl or whatever. Um, and the reality is, is, is that you've probably had a lot of people cross your path. However, you, you chose to let that person stay, right? Mm -hmm. Where you pushed out everybody else. You're like, mm, you weren't the one for me. You weren't the one that I was really looking for. It turned into like, I, I'm attracted to this because this is what I know, so I'm gonna go for it. And then you find yourself falling to the same things with the same guys or the same girls over and over again. And it's because you let them stay, right? Instead of saying like, oh, you were actually a good one, but you weren't gonna be the one that filled that, that toxic need in me or that like emotional hole or that avoidant hole or that need that I had. Um, wow, wow, wow. I'm just like mind blown. When he, I, you know what's funny? It's not funny, but like, I feel like when you talk sometimes, there are things that almost sound like they should be common sense. I'm like, oh my God, that makes total sense. 
But once you hear them, like you're saying them, it's like it clicks and it's like, yeah, how does that not make sense? Like, why didn't anybody think of that before? That's why I love psychology. Um, can you explain a little more what avoidance is, what that looks like? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Avoidance like depends on the person. Sometimes it's like emotional avoidance, right? Sometimes it's like communicative avoidance. Like I don't want to talk about this or, well, probably stems from the fact that I don't want to feel this. Um, mm. But avoidance, I think, is is a like a mechanism of defense, right? I think when we can avoid certain things or be in denial of certain things, it keeps us safe. Um, and just to clarify, defenses and and what we do, whether it's like to avoid or to intellectualize, which just means like I'm gonna talk about my problems till like I don't really have to, they don't click with me anymore, or I don't really have to feel them or whatever. Whatever the defense is, um, denial. Um, they're, they all serve a purpose, right? So just because somebody is defended in a certain way doesn't mean that's necessarily a bad thing because it's at one point in their life, that's what saved them, right? Mm -hmm. At one point in somebody's life, maybe avoidance is what they needed in an unhealthy situation. Um, so you hang around and you stay with that avoidance. But eventually at, at, at a certain point, these defenses are no longer serving the purposes that they once served, right? And now they're getting in the way of your relationships. They're getting in the way of your friendships. They're getting in the way of you experiencing life the way you should be. Um, and that's only one part of like our, somebody's mental health journey is, is being able to acknowledge defenses. Um, as a therapist now, not every defense I want to like dismantle in session with a client, you know, especially if it's a kid that lives in a, in a pretty rough house or they're going through something and that defense mechanism is what's keeping them safe. It's not something I'm going to go and like bring out of unconscious awareness and be like, this is what you do, dude. You know, yeah. um, because once you've made a defense, like once you've actualized it, once you've made it an unconscious thought conscious, it's no longer working in the way that it, it, it used to. Wow. I never thought of that. That makes sense. Cause once you know it, you can't unknow it, you know? Right. People, people will say sometimes like, I don't want to slip back into the same patterns. Do you always, there's always a chance that you can slip back to the same patterns, but um, your experience of that will always be different. It's like, once you've taken a step forward in this particular instance, there is no taking a step back um, because now you see it with new eyes. Yes. I know, I didn't know before, and now I'm back in the same situation. And even though I may be engaging with it, my mind looks at it differently. And I think that's, that's like a small victory for anybody um, that often goes un unacknowledged too. That's so true. And that makes, I mean, like it's clicking for me because when I started therapy, that was one of the things that my therapist told me when we started, she was like, cause I told her like, I was fearful that I wouldn't um, be like courageous enough to change, even though I would like, know, like I would know what I needed to change once I spoke to her. But like, what if I don't implement what I need to implement. And she kind of just said that she was like, you can't unlearn the things that things that I'm teaching you, like, you're going to know them once you hear them. And that's like what the main first couple of sessions were, were like, education, like she was just like teaching me what triggers meant what defense mechanisms meant. Um, family systems, like, I mean, things that pertain to me, but mainly it was like education. Mm -hmm. Yeah, psychoeducation is like a huge part of like, therapy and psychology in general uh, um so i wanted to go back were you gonna say something yeah. <laughs> i wanted to go back to the question i mean this is like unrelated but you talked about um transference and i know we had a conversation one time where you told me like you didn't know if what you were feeling was coming from you or was coming from a patient do you want to explain what that was this is like mind-blowing to me i don't i just i'm easily impressed maybe but <laughs> yeah um I think I was referring to there's like transference, which is what the patient is experiencing. And then there's countertransference, which is what you're experiencing of your patient. Okay. Um, so countertransference is like a big thing in psychology and, and certain kind of like modalities of it um, in particular. Um, and I think what I was talking to you about that day was um, sometimes you get an, an intuitive feeling, right? The client can be laughing and like saying all these things, but you're feeling like this, this very, like this other inside of you. And you're like, mm, are you laughing? I see, I hear what you're talking about. The conversation is definitely going this way, but I'm feeling something that I don't know if it belongs to me or if it doesn't. And um, I don't want to disclose like what, what me and the patient were talking about. Mm -hmm. 
but essentially the conversation was something, and this is like very, um, not how it was said, so not verbatim, but client was saying something funny, something laughing about something. And I felt like this extreme, like wave of anxiety. And I could almost pinpoint exactly how it felt. I was like, it feels like a really obese, like climber person, like scaling, like the walls of my heart. Right. And he's like really wow. felt really heavy in my chest. I got like a pulling down feeling. Um, and while the client was talking, I'm like sitting there processing with myself. Did something that the client just bring up, bring something up in me? Was I just triggered by this in some way? Um, and after like, this is like split second processing. And I'm like, no, I was like, this feeling does not belong to me. I think this was given to me. Um, and that's part of what like transference is, is using the emotions in the room. Um, so I, I asked the client, I was like, I was like, hey, look, I totally hear what you're saying. And like this conversation and what we're talking about, I was like, however, there's like this feeling that I'm experiencing right now. And I'm not sure if you're feeling something similar. And then I explained the feeling to the client and she started crying. Um, yes, wow. I have like session and I just like haven't really known how to process it or like how to even like whatever. Um, but counter transference can look a lot like that too, right? And so like assessing what I'm experiencing and like, is, is this something that's coming up in me or is this something that the client is kind of giving to me? Um, there's been conversations I've had with my supervisor that I'm like, I have one client in particular that what they say is very interesting and like what we're talking about has like a lot of substance and like we're getting things done, but I'm always falling asleep in session. I'm so tired for whatever reason, as soon as we get into the session and it's with this one particular client, I feel very like tired. Um, I sometimes have to pinch my leg to like stay awake. Um, and then, but I, I was telling her, I was like, we're having conversation and we're getting places right when we're talking. And my supervisor was like, um, that's your client is like emotionally like blocking you. Right. Um, and it's wow. right. And then, and then she was saying, she was like, that experience that you have is probably an experience that a lot of people have with that client for whatever reason. Um, so therapy is just like, it looks a lot like one big mirror. I think mm -hmm. what you experience of your client is probably what other people experience of your client. Um, so taking that information in and then having a productive conversation, a productive way to process things um, in session to get the client to like understand what, what what's behind the behavior right like where does it stem from where's the pain um the shame where's um where's the joy you know that's incredible i don't know why that blows my mind so much i mean but it's how you were saying in the beginning i feel like where it's like an exchange of energy um that i guess i just would never think about unless you explain it that way right um clearly you are very knowledgeable and you've you're just sharing so much wisdom but with everything that you know do you still have your own therapist that you go to well, yeah <laughs> <laughs> absolutely um i spend once a week um uh, like i don't know i have my own issues quite a bit of them so um there's like some avoidance on my end too. Sometimes I won't show up to sessions. Sometimes I don't want to go. Sometimes I don't want to process my week. Um, and that's stuff that I work through with my therapist. I work through things that come up with clients sometimes. And it's never like a full disclosure about like my client or anything like that. But, um, oh, this client brought up something like this this week. And it really brought this up for me. And I feel stuck working with this client because I feel like there's things that I haven't processed about this that I need to, right? Um, so that's what some of the therapy looks like. But yeah, your therapist needs a therapist. Um, my supervisor, who's 70 years old, um, has been with her therapist for like, I don't know, what she told me, like 20 something years. Wow. Woman who's been in the field for like our lives times two, you know? Um, so yeah, every therapist like needs a therapist. And we all have our own stuff too. I think it's, I think it's often lost on people. Like, oh, you go to a therapist and you're assuming that they're so grounded mm -hmm. and that like, their emotional affairs in order. Um, yes and no, you know, but we're human. And I think we, just like somebody else has childhood trauma, so do we just like how somebody else experiences uh, loss and stuff like that. I have a lot of things in my romantic relationships that come up pretty often. Um, 
I'll read it out loud. <laughs> Nancy's asking, do you think we should keep the same therapist for that long? Um, it depends. It depends. Um, it depends on the kind of therapist you see, right? If, if you go see, um, there's always things to work through. There's always something, you know, there's a, a time for termination when that day comes, if that day ever comes. But yeah, I think you, you can see a therapist for that long. We talked about this because I, I had that question for you one time where I was like, what's going to happen? Like, I'm assuming at some point, either financially, I'm not going to be able to, you know, pay for it every week anymore, or I may want to switch at some point in my life, you know, like, even though I know I'm going to want one long term. But like, I asked you, like, do, like, what do I do? And you're like, yeah, it's okay to break up with your therapist, you know, like, yeah, it, it is okay to break up with your therapist, especially if, if the, the working relationship is no longer working anymore. Um, therapy is like an act of self care. It's an act of self love. Um, and when you go, you show up for you. It's like, for some people, it's one of the only times that they ever show up for themselves, you know? So sometimes you'll have somebody that never shows up for themselves and you'll see that they go to therapy very sporadically. Like one week it's on, two weeks they're not coming, a week they're on, a week they're not coming. It's like every time you don't show up to therapy, you're not really showing up for yourself, you know? But when, well, that was a tangent, but back to the point of, yeah, when you're, you find it, you're ready to break up with your therapist, break up. Okay. Um, I, this is a personal opinion. <laughs> I think that everyone needs therapy. Like I just have come to that conclusion. Um, but obviously I know, I mean, I know because we talked about it and I know like deep down that everyone should do it when they're ready. You know, you shouldn't like push people, I guess, um, because they're only going to learn as much as they're ready to learn. But what would be your word of advice generally for people um, about going to therapy and also maybe if it's more specific advice towards men? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the general advice is that I think everybody um, should be in therapy, you know. You know? I think, yeah, for all the reasons I've said and for all the things that we've talked about, like, obviously, everybody has stuff to work through. Um, but yeah, I think everybody should be in therapy. Um, for men, um, applies. But at the same time, therapy is something you have to be um, wanting, you know, you have to seek that out because therapy doesn't start when you start to get into the nitty gritty about your emotions and your past and your um, your relationships and your parents and your family systems and the structure and the enmeshment, it doesn't begin there. Therapy begins as soon as I get on my phone and Google therapist in my area and I call one. You know, that's the second you've made a decision to do something for yourself. Um, and if you're not in the space to do that, um, I think you should, I think my general advice number two is like, ask yourself why, you know, I don't think we ask ourselves why enough. Like, why do I feel this way about this? Why don't I want to talk to somebody about this? Um, mm. And you need to be honest with yourself about that. You know, I just don't want to do it because I feel like I'm fine. Common answer. <laughs> um, that, you know, like, or I can go to my psychiatrist and get medication. You probably just don't want to talk about it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so when I know when I started realizing like, okay, I'm going to actually go find a therapist. Um, if it wasn't for you, I would have been a little lost and kind of just picked one out of, you know, word of mouth that someone recommended or Googled near me. And I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with that, but I'm very grateful that I had you because you, I forget how you worded it. And maybe if you remember, you could explain it to people. Like you made sure that I found the right therapist for what I needed. Like for, I, I don't know if you, do you remember like what we talked about that day? I, I think so. I vaguely, um, I think, we talked about, yeah, I asked you, I was like, what is it that you're looking for, right? Mm -hmm. What you're looking to process, because there's different kinds of therapy, right? When you go on, if you go on, um, for those of you that don't know, there's a website, it's called Psychology Today, and it'll give you like, you put in your zip code, and then it'll shoot out all the therapists in your area, and their credentials, right? If they're an, um, an MFT, if they're an um, LCSW, if they're a MSW, if they're a PsyD, if they're a PhD, um, and then it'll tell you like insurance and whatever, all that stuff. It's like, mm -hmm. if you're thinking about going to therapy, um, 
And I think I had asked you, because there's different kinds of therapy, right? There's like uh, CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy. There's like psychodynamic therapy. There's psychoanalysis. There's like a whole bunch. There's like a slew of them. Um, and if you're looking for like coping skills and ways to, to like kind of process things, but um, keep them at a certain level, right? You might want to look for something that's more CBT, right? It's a lot of homework. It's a lot of thought logs and um, and processing the we call it the cognitive triangle. It's the think, feel, act. So like your, your whatever order you want to put that in, but like um, your thoughts elicit a feeling and those feelings elicit an action mm. or like your feelings elicit a thought and the thought elicits an action. And then that's just kind of how we like go through life. So like recognizing the fact that like, I just had this feeling, this is, this is what I'm feeling. And I had, or like, I just had this thought and this thought evoked this feeling in me, right? I thought about when my um, well, hypothetical like partner cheated on me last year. And now I'm, I like am remembering that and I'm feeling a certain way. And the action that follows that is like either an angry text or a phone call, or I'm going to go do something to like make myself feel better. I'm going to go hook up with somebody else or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like that. So that's like your CBT kind of thing. And then you have dynamic and like analytic work that focuses a lot on your childhood, right? What went on, your losses, your gains, your um, attachments, um, your object relations, like all, all these like very, um, the counter transference and transference is very much like a, like a dynamic thing that happens. Um, some therapists won't really acknowledge like a feeling like that because the work is to acknowledge your thoughts, feelings, and actions, your thought mm. Um other therapists are very so for those therapists right the cbt therapists a, a lot of it is um their tools are those things right the, the thought logs and the journals and the the breaking things down all the way to like their, their their simplest parts and then for other kinds of therapists the the tool is the therapist i am the tool i walk into session and i am what we use to um heal right to fix right um so, yeah, it all depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking to go back in time, you know, um, and to really work through, like, the hard stuff, you probably want to go a more, like, analytic route. If you're looking for something that's um, – that you get results relatively quickly, right, because you're getting to know all these things about yourself, about your thoughts and your feelings and your actions and what have you, you go the CBT route. Um, analytic therapy, dynamic work is, like, that long-term stuff. It's the stuff that lasts for years – CBT is a stuff that lasts for however long until you feel like you're ready to kind of terminate and be done. Um, okay, hold on. CBT was the first one you explained with the triangle, the thought, action, feel. Right. And then what was the second one? What's uh, it called? Psychodynamic or psychoanalysis, right? There's what like would be the letters that like come after? You know what I'm saying? Because like when I was looking it up on Psychology Today, you had to do it for me because you're like, there's um, – like side D and then yeah. um, oh that doesn't matter I think your okay. your therapeutic modality right the theoretical orientation which is what all these different things are um, depend on on the person on the therapist right uh. so um, MFT or your LMFT um, your licensed marriage and family therapist mm. and specialize in um, psychoanalysis or psychodynamic work um, your PhD or your PsyD, right, um, can uh, specialize in CBT. So what you what you want to look for essentially is like what they specialize in, and it'll say it too. Like it'll say like I specialize in cognitive behavioral therapy, or I specialize in psychodynamic work. Um, okay, forgive me if I'm repeating myself, but just to reiterate, um, like in in different terms. So when I went to you again, you know, you, one of the things you asked me was like, okay, well, like, what are you, what are you looking for to talk about one specific traumatic experience that you want to work through? Or like, do you just, do you have like verbal diarrhea and need your, you need someone to help you piece it together and make sense of it? Um, so your answer might be the same to my last question, but like, what, what do those two different therapists look like? Do they have different letters certifications do they specialize in something different 
No, it would kind of just be like the same, same gist. Um, again, it's like you just like do your work. I think um, tools that we're not given and that we don't know about, which it sucks that we don't talk about this enough in school, um, is um, what what is like therapy look like, right? What is mental health and what is mental illness and like what are what are different kinds of like therapy that I can do that like will suit me as a person. Some people are not cut out for um, analysis, right? So for dynamic work, some people like, they just won't do well in that kind of like therapeutic setting. Some people thrive in a cognitive behavioral therapy it's kind of the, um, but yeah, if it's like, I don't know. I, I, I It's cool. I just have a lot of questions. <laughs> Um, so basically, no, no one therapist for someone who's just, you know, getting their first therapist, it kind of just depends on what you need and what you're looking for. Right. And also, the therapist's personality, right? Like, not all of us are the same. I'm in a program with 24 other people. And each and every one of us are so different. Um, and we all have different styles. We all have, I have my own personality, you know, I'm like a fucking ghost. So like, when I... <laughs> Um, like there's an energy that I have, right. That's very different from the energy of somebody else in my cohort. Right. Um, so apart from your therapist credentials and like what they specialize in and what they do for the most part, you also want to just check if you vibe with that person, you know, um, do I, do we like get along? Can I, do I feel like I can be honest with you? Do I feel like I can like genuinely talk to you about what's going on? Do I feel comfortable and do I feel safe? You know, um, mm -hmm. If there's something about that that's not clicking for you, then go find another therapist. And a good therapist won't get offended by that. You know, a good therapist wants you to find somebody that's going to be good for you. Um, so, yeah. There's therapists, too, that will be like, I. this is a client that I don't jive with. You know, sometimes there's like a like a pre-screened phone call and the mm -hmm. therapist, that phone call, whether or not you guys are a good fit for each other. Um, but goodness of fit is everything, too. If you're not a good fit for me, hey, I have somebody actually that I think would work really well with you. Can I send you their information? Um, besides therapy, what are daily practices we can implement to maintain our mental health? Good one, Nance. Answer the hot questions. Keep it coming, girl. <laughs> yeah. um, meditation, mindfulness, um, breath work, sleep, the way we eat. I mean, these are all things that are very like common. When we're anxious, we forget to breathe. You forget to breathe, oxygen doesn't get to your brain. Um, you can't really think clearly. Um, when you're anxious and you're spiraling, you can't sleep. Something I learned in my own personal therapy when I was an undergrad was I would come into session and I would be super like dysregulated and all like like in a, in a thing. And something my therapist would always tell me is like, what time did you wake up today? Like seven o'clock. She's like, what time did you go to bed the night before? three um what did you eat today oh i had a bagel at what time <laughs> she's like so on top of your energy being depleted right we have um our our mental energy is not inexhaustible we don't have a, a ton of it it doesn't just keep going and going and going it's like our physical energy at some point it drains out throughout the day right so what fuels your mental energy is your sleep right the way we're eating our the consistency of our diet um, our breathing and like our self care. Um, yeah, we should Ash. Um, so yeah, all these things are like really, I, they're vital and they're important to, um, our, our mental health. And we often forget, right? So like I would, after we would do the whole thing, of what time did you wake up? What time did you go to sleep? What did you eat? And she'd be like, it's, it's, Besides what's already going on in your life, it's not it, its not a shocker to me that you feel this way right now. It's 8 o'clock at night, you know? Um, yeah. And you have done the most today. On top of all the stuff that you did, you went to the gym, you went to school, you wrote a paper, and now you're, like, wondering why you're crying, you know? <laughs> um, so it's like, yeah, you're right. Um, and it doesn't mean that just changing your diet and your sleeping habits and all this other stuff is going to make the pain of life go away or the pain of our experiences, but it does mitigate that, right? It takes it to a level that it's like manageable and bearable, and then we can work from there. Um, so I think that's that's part of what's really important in your day-to-day -day, is being mindful of yourself. Check in with yourself. Where's my heart at today? How do I feel? Um, 
what do I have the emotional capacity for? Can I say, yeah. um, yeah. So oh, good. And just giving yourself grace when you don't have the capacity for it, you know? Um, I had therapy, like, I think two days ago, and I was telling Nance, literally, I don't remember if we were talking about this today or not, but that I, yesterday, had the hardest time getting out of bed, and I was like, I felt like I slept enough, like, it was weird, I was weirdly tired, and it was like, like, throwing me off, and then I didn't realize until later in the day, I was like, oh, I unpacked a lot with my therapist this last session, and it drains me. Like, I, you forget almost that, like, emotions are energy. And, like, they, if, if it takes a lot to process a whole thought and, like, you're learning a lot about yourself all at once, you're getting all this information thrown at you, you're giving information, like, that kind of depleted me and transpired physically. Like, I, I became physically tired. Yeah. Yeah. It, like, really, it, it takes, like, a lot from you. I Just the other day on Monday, I had a session with my therapist. And I had plans right after to go out. Um to a bar to grab some drinks with some of the people in my, in my program. And um, I literally, I, after session, I, I fought with her, right? We had like, uh, like this battle, I guess, of the minds in, in that session. It was like a really draining session. I sat on my couch, and I was like, I can't move. I literally, <laughs> I'm so tired. I went to bed that night, like maybe three hours later, and I was like, I'm just gonna knock out. Um, yeah. Yeah, processing it's things. It's like that. And I don't mean that to like sound discouraging to anybody who's like maybe on the fence of fighting a therapist or anything. Um, but I'll never forget what you told me before I started therapy. You're like, Dre, you know, I don't want you to get discouraged. Some days, you know, it's going to be cool. You're going to be learning so much about yourself. And other days, it's going to be hard. It's going to be work. It's not going to feel good. But that's when it's working. Like that's when when you're getting places. And it's so true. Yeah. So oh, true. Yeah, therapy can be very discouraging. Sometimes, sometimes you're gonna leave worse than you felt when you went in, right? You're gonna be like, that was horrible. And I feel like shit, you know. Um, and I wish that I actually didn't have session today. But that's where the work gets done, you know. Um, and then it's also not your therapist's job to pull you out of that all the time. Sometimes I want to take you to that place. I want to take you deep, as deep as we can go at, to the place that you have the emotional capacity for, right? And then um, if you leave feeling horrible, then you left feeling horrible that day, guess what? We're going to process that next week. You, uh, people often forget, too, that your therapist is a different kind of relationship in your life. You have your family. You have your friends. You have your partners. Um, and then you have your therapist, right? They all fit in different categories for the most part. And your therapist, you can count on to be your constant, right? I can blow up on you this week, and I could say, you know what? I really freaking hate coming here horrible and like you didn't help me at all and i'll sit there and be like okay well let's talk about that next week and then you'll <laughs> talk about next week about things that you thought about realized and um it's just like it doesn't matter what you do you're not going to push me away you know you may be able to push away your friends and your family but your therapist is your your constant you man, I was loving it. She's like, can we have like five sequels? I mean, if you have any questions, feel free to ask now. <laughs> is there anything I'm out of my bullet points that we prepped for? But I mean, you know, I could talk about this all day. Is there anything else at the top of your head that you like, feel like we didn't touch on that maybe you want to? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Does anybody have any questions? There's like eight people on. Does any of you eight people have any questions? <laughs> Nancy might be tapped out on questions. but. Yeah, I mean, we hit a lot of good points, but it's hard to, like, talk about everything psychology-related. I'm sure we could do a whole other talk, like, just relationship-based. People love to hear about that. I love to hear about that. I'm people. Um, what's in the tank behind you? This girl. It's a, it, my friend's beard is I'm watching. Oh, my God, my apartment looks like a mess. Don't even look. <laughs> um, you know what? They're actually something me and Dre were talking about this on the phone um, right before. Um, and... It's things that you learn in developmental psychology. So this is like if you're an avid reader um, on parenting books, for the most part, about psych books, um, you'll know certain things about this. But I think something that's a concern for a lot of like expecting parents, and I'm saying this because there's one on the live right now. Two. There's two. Oh, there's two? Yeah, so hit it. <laughs> is this um, fear that some of us have of not being a good enough parent, right? Like 
is there something I can do to fuck up my kid? I think, you know, it's like the question that like goes through people's minds. Like what if they go through this or what if they experience this one kids are very resilient. Um, and two, what's really important is to meet your kids emotional needs. Um, the literature actually states that um, you only have to be a good enough parent 30% of the time. So take the weight off of your shoulders for a second and take a huge breath. Um, because yeah, 30% of your parenting skills have to be good, but just meet your kids emotional needs. Um, there's, I tried this with my nephew when I learned this, but there's a book that I read called The Whole Grain Child um, by Dan Siegel, I think. Um, and he talks about in the book, um, how we have like an upstairs brain and a downstairs brain, right? Your upstairs brain is your, like your logic and your reasoning. And this is very like an elementary school way to say like what's actually going on in these like processes. And your downstairs brain is like your primitive brain, right? It's your reptilian first brain. Um, and when kids start to throw tantrums, what happens is that they're normally working from their downstairs brain. So a kid is screaming, they're emotionally dysregulated. They're feeling all kinds of ways about something. And then, um, you're trying to introduce logic into that mm. or nothing of what you're saying. Don't do that. You're, you're, you're making a mess. You're whatever. Uh, stop acting this way. They're not getting that. They're, they're working from something way down here and it's not processing up here. Um, so what you do is like engage the kid. Um, so I did this with my nephew one time. He was really upset that I was going to go leave. I was going to go to the mall. He was a lot younger. He was maybe like three. Um, and, um, he was crying and he wanted me to stay. He wanted me to take him to the park, but I really had to go. Um, so I got to his level and I spoke to what he was like experiencing, which was like, you're upset that I'm leaving. And he was like, he nodded his head and he was crying. I was like, you're really angry at me that I'm leaving. And he was like, yeah, I was like, and you don't want me to leave. And he was like, no, I don't want you to leave. It took a second, right? For all mm -hmm. this. Um, but I just met him where he was at, right? And you introduced that to the downstairs brain, which is like, what they're experiencing right now is this, it's pain, it's hurt, it's, it's fear, it's whatever. Um, and then um, after I, we were able to get to that place that he knew that I was understanding him, I was like, but I have to go, you know, I still have to leave. Um, can we do this when I get back? Can we talk about this when I get back? About when I get back. And then because I met him where he was at, it was easier for us to like creep up the stairs and to talk about, um, logical things all right now i know that when he gets back we can do this together um and then he stopped, stopped crying um so it's about engagement and meeting your kids where they're at and it's probably really easy to get i don't have kids um i don't know if i would be a great father i can already tell <laughs> bro i'm too selfish hell no um <laughs> but yeah this it yeah uh what's the name of the book someone's asking uh i'll type it in that's so good so good, Nikki. I, you know, what's funny is that, like, again, you think it's common sense to do that, but you're. I feel like when you're in that moment when you like a kid is like spazzing out, you want to like reprimand and just like, even if you feel like you're doing them good by like, explaining, like, you can't cry, I'm gonna leave. Like, you're just trying to be logical, but like, I like the way you explain that. Yeah. Uh, and it's a thought. You know, I'm not even expecting children anytime soon, but. I've thought about that because since I'm going to therapy, I'm just like, oh my gosh, like if I wouldn't have gone to therapy, would I have messed up my child? Like what's going to happen? But that's, can you say that again? What was it? You can only have to be a good parent 30% of the time to not mess up your kid. It's, it's the, the term in psychology is called the good enough mother. <laughs> good enough mother. There you have it, moms. Um, so I guess I'll wrap it up there just to not go too long. Um, in the comments, if you guys, if we missed something that you wanted to hear about, um, I don't know if little Nikki's going to want to do this again. I'm sorry, by the way, I keep calling you that. That's just what I call you, little Nikki, but Nick, if Nick wants to do this again, um, we can talk about something else psychology related. This is my favorite topic. If it's something that you enjoy to hear about, please let us know, give us feedback. Um, and that's it. Anything else? No. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Love you. Love you. Talk Bye. to you later. Bye. 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 Bye, Haley. Bye. Bye, Ash. And then. <laughs>